Welcome to lecture number 15 for ECE 320 Electronics 1 DC to DC converters. Now converting AC voltages is really easy. You just use a transformer. DC is a lot harder. You can do it, but it tends to be much more difficult and lose efficiency. The objective here is to convert a DC voltage from one voltage to another. Uh, reasons you might want to do that. If you want to connect your car to your cell phone, the car's battery is 13.2 volts. Your cell phone is 5 volts. I need a way to step down 13.2 volts down to 5 volts. There's also a way to go up. I want to go from 5 volts DC to say 12 volts. The reason being is in the microprocessor cell phone is 5 volts DC. That's TTL logic. The serial port on a PC needs plus minus 12 volts. So I might need a way to increase the voltage. This lecture looks at part of it, the first part, dropping the voltage, that's a buck converter. Now there's a couple ways to do it. The most straightforward way is to use a voltage divider. That's something we've already looked at. For example, if I want to take a 12 volt source and drop it down to 5 volts, I could just use two resistors. That'll give me 5 volts of VL. This works. This converts 12 volts down to 5 volts. However, it only works if you don't use it. For example, suppose I want to draw 100 milliamps at 5 volts. 100 milliamps at 5 volts is 50 ohms. If I connect a 50 ohm resistor across the load, then what happens is these two become in parallel, and the voltage goes from 5 volts suddenly down to 0.08 volts. So this is a 5 volt power supply that disappears as soon as you try to use it. There are ways around that. If one have a 5 volt power supply capable of 20 milliamps, what it could do is take the same circuit we had before and an op-amp buffer. Uh, this is one reason to use an op-amp. It has a high impedance coming in, so this voltage won't change with the load. And op-amps can typically drive up to 20 milliamps. You can't actually get op-amps capable of more than that. There's a 2544 op-amp that's capable of 2 amps. That's an $18 op-amp though, so we tend not to use those. The problem with this circuit is if the voltage the 12 volt supply changes, then the voltage here changes. A way to fix that is use the zener diode. This 70k resistor just keeps current flowing through the zener to keep it in the active region or zener region. That keeps the voltage right here at 5 volts. And the op amp then provides a nice steady 5 volt supply to your load. 5 volts at up to 20 milliamps. The problem with this approach is the efficiency. If I want to deliver 20 milliamps to the load, I'm delivering 100 milliwatts to the load, 5 volts at 20 milliamps. The power supply, the op amp's got to be powered by something, probably the 12 volt supply. That 20 milliamps has to come from somewhere, it's going to come from your 12 volt supply. So I'm using 240 milliwatts to drive 100 milliwatts, so I'm only 41% efficient. Uh, third circuit, this is a 7805 regulator. These are actually really nice. If you don't care about, about efficiency, this is a really easy way to convert one voltage to another. There's 7805, that's 5 volts out. There's also 7804, 4 volts out. 7806, 6 volts out. There's a whole slew of these. They're fairly cheap. They work extremely well. The efficiency is not great, though. What's on the inside is the same Zener diode that we had before. This regulates this at 5.7 volts. To increase the current capability, I add a transistor. What that transistor does is if I draw a little bit of current through the base, that gets amplified by beta. So now I can do things like drive 3 amps at the output. Uh, 7805 is really easy to use. You just have three pins, power, ground, and the output voltage right here. The problem with them, oh, they also work over a wide range. This 12 volts isn't real critical. It'll work all the way down to about 6 volts at the low end, 36 volts on the high end. The problem with them, though, is the efficiency. Again, if I want to draw 1 amp at the output, I've got 5 volts at 1 amp, 5 watts coming out. The power comes from here. If I have 1 amp going out, I've got 1 amp coming in. 12 volts at 1 amp is 12 watts coming in, 5 watts going out. Once again, I'm 41% efficient. If you want increased efficiency, that's where you need a buck converter. A uh, buck converter consists of this. I've got my voltage. Here I'm going to assume a 20 volt power supply. I want to drop down to voltage. A switch, an inductor, and your load. What the inductor does is it keeps the current constant. If I close the switch, 
I'll have 20 volts powering my load. If I open the switch, I'll have 0 volts powering the load. By varying the duty cycle, switching the, turning the switch on and off at different uh, percentages, I can vary the voltage at V1 and V2. If I do that, V1 is going to have a highly variable voltage. The inductor, what that does is that keeps the current flowing. So when the switch is closed, the inductor builds up energy in the magnetic field as the current goes up. When the switch opens, the field collapses, and the inductor is your battery. It provides energy to V2 to keep the current flowing. Then the switch opens, I build up the energy in the inductor, switch closes, the current keeps flowing. That's one way to think of it. Another way to think of it is, is a filter. By voltage division, the voltage V2 is Z1 over Z1 plus Z2. At DC, this has low resistance, so the voltage goes right through. At 1 kilohertz, this will have a high resistance, so the ripple, the AC portion of V2, will be much smaller than it is at V1. The capacitor acts as another filter. If this impedance is, say, 50 ohms, half 100 ohms, at DC this has no effect, at AC it's half the resistance, so I've had the ripple. So that's kind of the idea behind it. With a buck converter, I need to... There's two parts, analysis and design. If I start with analysis, suppose I had a buck converter with 40% duty cycle. What the voltage is going to look like is when the switch is closed, I have 20 volts, of course. When the switch is open, there's still current flowing. This diode provides a path for the current to flow. Uh, basically with an inductor, you can't shut the current off to zero. You want to keep it flowing. This is the path for it. The side effect is when I have this diode, this is ground, the top side is going to be minus 0.7 volts. So the voltage across V1 is going to go from plus 20 to minus 0.7. The average will be the average, 40% of 20 plus 60% of minus 0.7 gives you 7.58 volts. That's the average, that's the DC term. The AC term is the ripple. The fluctuation goes from 20 to minus 0.7. It's 20.7 volts peak to peak. Now to find V2, um, that's actually a hard problem. If the input was a constant, I could solve. If the input was a sine wave, I could solve. This isn't either one. So what we're going to do is use a typical engineering approach. If I have a problem that's hard to solve, change the problem but change it in a way that it keeps the flavor of the old problem uh, and change it to one that you can solve. So here, let's pretend that V1 has an average of 7.58, same as the actual average. The frequency is 1 kilohertz, and the ripple is 20.7 volts peak to peak. With this approximation, I've got the same DC voltage, same peak to peak ripple, same frequency. It's almost the same waveform. It's not, so my answer will be slightly wrong. Uh, but I can check my answer in Circuit Lab. It should be close. Again, it'll be a little bit different because this isn't a sine wave and I'm treating it like a sine wave. That's typical engineering. Change the problem to one you can solve. So, let's do the two steps. I need to use DC analysis and AC analysis with superposition. The first part is DC. The average of V1 is 7.58 volts. At DC, the inductor doesn't matter. At DC, the capacitor doesn't matter. So we just have a voltage divider. The average is just going to be 100 with 100 plus 15 times V1. Uh, 6.5913 volts. Now let's do AC analysis. At AC, this is 1 kilohertz, so the ripple at V1 is 1 kilohertz. The inductance at 1 kilohertz, or 6280 radians per second, is J628 ohms. Capacitor becomes minus J15.9 ohms. Put these in parallel, I get 2.46 minus J15 ohms. Now by voltage division, it's going to be R1 over R1 plus R2 times your input. And if I solve, I get 0.53 volts. There's actually an angle on this. I want the magnitude of V2. What the angle tells me is that V2 will be slightly out of phase from V1. I don't really care. I just care about the magnitude of V2. So here, that's a complex number. I just took the amplitude. Put the two together, that says that V2 should be, on average, 6.959 volts on DC with a 0.53 volt ripple at 1 kilohertz. To check in Circuit Lab, I need to build a switch. Uh, the PWM is a block in Circuit Lab that outputs a 
pulse width modulate a signal. I want this to be 40% on. So I'll have the voltages going from 0 to 10 volts. So 4 volts is 40% on. And the frequency is 1 kilohertz. Take that PWM, have that drive an NPN transistor. When this is 5 volts, the NPN turns on. I have a path to ground, and the PNP turns on. So there's the switch uh, closed. When V0 is 0 volts, the NPN turns off, no current flow, no current flow over here, the Q1 is off. So 5 volts on, 0 volts off, and there's my switch. Then you have the rest of the buck converter, your diode, inductor, and capacitor. And this R1 I don't like, that's part of the inductor. If you have an inductor, you inherently have a resistor. Now I can simulate, and here's what you get. What I calculated for a V2 was 6.59 volts. It's actually 6.40 volts. Again, not too far off. The AC, I calculated 5.30 millivolts peak to peak. It's actually 592. The reason I'm off is because I assumed that V1 is 20.7 volts peak to peak. That's not exactly true for the first harmonic, uh, but it gets you close. Typically what I would do is analyze with an approximation like we did here. And if you aren't good enough or aren't satisfied with that, you want to be more certain, throw it in Circuit Lab. In terms of efficiency, the big advantage of the buck converter is efficiency. The 7806, that's a 6-volt output, just to keep it apples to apple, apples comparison, would be 30% efficient. The buck converter, in contrast, is 84% efficient. And you can see that back on this circuit. If I have current flowing, the power to the load is the output power. The total power is I squared R, power loss in I2, R2, I squared R1, and the voltage drop. This is a 0.2 volt drop times current gives you power. That's the total power when the switch is closed. When the switch is open, it's almost the same calculation, but instead of drop across Q1, I would include the voltage drop across diode 2, that 0.7 volts. Put them both together, the average efficiency is 79% or 81%. That's a whole lot better than the 30% efficient of the voltage divider, or 7806, um, for quite a bit more work. Next, that's analysis. Let's do design. Suppose I want to build a buck converter that converts 20 volts down to 5 volts with a ripple of 0.5 volts at the load um, and a frequency of 1 kilohertz. The first step is to find the DC analysis. What's the DC voltage at V1 and what should the duty cycle be? If V2 is 5 volts, at DC L doesn't matter, C doesn't matter, by voltage division, V2 is a percentage of V1. To make V2 equal to 5 volts, V1 has to be 5.75 volts. To get the duty cycle then, 5.75 is the average of 20 and minus 0.7. Alpha is the duty cycle. That works out to a duty cycle of 31%. So I want this to be 31% on. That'll set the DC voltage. For the AC voltage, I've got two degrees of freedom, one constraint. Uh, one approach would be, let's just pick the inductor to reduce the ripple by 10 times, so that the 20.7 volt peak-to-peak -peak ripple here becomes 2 volts peak-to-peak -peak at V2. To make the ripple 10 times smaller, the inductor should be 10 times bigger than the resistor, so your voltage division, R1 over R1 plus R2, if this is 10 times R, the ripple will be about 10 times smaller. Um, if uh, the inductor is 10 times the impedance of the resistor, that says the inductor should be 159 millihenries. To get the capacitor, I now have 2 volts peak-to-peak -peak ripple at V2. I want it to be 0.5. I want to reduce the ripple by 4.14 times. So I make the capacitor 4.14 times smaller than the resistor. Um, that makes the capacitor minus J24 ohms. And to do that at 1 kilohertz, the capacitor should be 6.59 microfarads. So there's the design. I can then check it in Circuit Lab, build the circuit, change the duty cycle to 31%, change the inductor, change the capacitor, 
and what I get is almost correct. The DC voltage is almost spot on. The AC voltage is a little bit too high on the ripple. We'll see why that is in our next lecture on Fourier transforms, but for now I can just see that, well, I made some approximations. I wound up being 6% too high. A fix is just make the capacitor 6% bigger. That'll actually drop the ripple down to what I, what I want, 497 millivolts peak to peak. That would be DC to DC converters and ECE320 electronics one.